Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Happy to see you, even if it's on Zoom. If this is your first time to an AMA event, welcome. AMA is a national organization that provides insights, trends, and mentorship opportunities for marketers. The Atlanta Marketing Chapter is actually a top five in the country. If you like what you hear today and would like to learn more and even join us, you can go to ama-atlanta.com. You can also follow us on LinkedIn to learn more and follow our future announcements. Uh, we do wanna take the time to thank our AMA members, as well as our sponsors that help to make AMA Atlanta possible, including all of the agencies and brands that you see here. You can learn more about all of them by going to our website. And now for the topic, giving marketers the remote advanced entertainment advertising strategies. I do wanna take a moment to thank the committee who helps us shape these topics for marketers, including Kevin Planowski, Lisa Cheatham, Lisa Mark, Ta Vin, and Becca Hannon, who's currently on maternity leave. We pursued this topic because we see entertainment companies evolving their programming strategies to retain and grow viewership. They are deploying a variety of linear on-demand streaming and social strategies to stay relevant with viewers. Today, we will learn more from Warner Media, Effective and Sidekick on how marketers can join the journey along with their brands. And today's format will be a 30 minute topic discussion followed by a 15 minute questions with attendees. You will see that there's a Q and A chat box. We encourage you to drop in your questions and then we will answer those questions at the end of the session. So now I'm excited to introduce the lineup for today. I'm introducing Peter Scott, the VP of Innovation of Emerging Media for Warner Media. Pete will be both a moderator and panelist for today. Pete works very closely with AT&T on 5G, as well as on edge compute initiatives. He works on US sports betting platforms, as well as created a modern day newsroom. Pete works with brands across the Turner sports portfolio that includes the NHL, NBA, Major League Bar Baseball, and March Madness on a variety of opportunities. Pete is an all around super energetic and smart guy. We're lucky to have him today. Pete, it's all yours. Thanks, Nick, and uh, thanks, AMA. Huge fan of the organization, both here in Atlanta, where I'm based, and around the country, connecting, I think, all of us in this uh, crazy times and, and trying to learn from each other, whether that's through, through Zoom or, you know, just uh, having a cup of coffee. I think it's really important to be able to share these ideas. As you can see, we are recording, so you can play this back or share this with, um, you know, any of your uh, fellow colleagues at, um, at uh, where you work. So I'll just get started. I wanna first introduce uh, Michael Cooper. Um, Michael Cooper is head of media at Affected TV. He is based in Los Angeles, California. Um, and Michael has a really interesting job of basically helping sort of traditional marketers um, uh, market their products across uh, Comcast um, you know, infrastructure, whether it be you know, digital or, or cable. So. Michael, let me just uh, say thanks for joining and I'll get back to you in a second. And then also uh, Tree Wiglon, who works here in Atlanta as well. Uh, he's an, uh, a friend, uh, works with an agency called Sidekick that recently got purchased. Congratulations on that. And so what I wanted to sort of start today is let these guys give a brief description of what they do um, in their space, what they do for their particular companies. And then we'll move right into you know, sort of questions I have for them. Again, please note that you're more than welcome to, uh, you know, uh, send any questions through the Q&A um, uh, button in your lower screen. So looking forward to, to hosting this and, and moving forward. So Michael, why don't you just give a brief description of what Effective TV does for marketers across the country, uh, country both on a national and regional level. Um, I think it'd be interesting for people to know what, what you guys do for Comcast. Sure. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks for the invite and thanks for the introduction. I, I work at Comcast Effective. Uh, Effective is the advertising arm for Comcast. Um, basically, we, we find audiences for advertisers and we put together media campaigns that are, are multi-screen and um, works to individual KPIs. Because we deal with so many different types of advertisers, the, uh, the, the KPIs that we're solving for are all over the place. Uh, 
Um, my particular role um, focuses on media and entertainment. Um, that's I've been with the company for about two and a half years, and um, I primarily uh, focused on um, tune in advertising and uh, gamers and um, studio studios and movies and um, everything that comes within that vertical. And most recently, uh, the scope of my responsibilities have expanded. So now I'm also looking at uh, emerging, emerging um, verticals as well. And that includes uh, several categories. It could be any category, but it's really categories where we think we could put together and solve for it in a way that really unlocks the potential for a particular category. So I think sports betting is one of them, uh, CPG is another, but we're also looking at um, everything from financial um, uh, categories to um, to D to C. It, it, it's it's all over the place, but there's an analysis that uh, goes into that um, to ensure that we can unlock uh, the value and and provide uh, additional revenue for for Comcast Effective. Okay, that's awesome. I may maybe give us a, a scenario later on where if I'm a marketer, how do I you know basically engage with you, and then where does that campaign basically flow through across all your touch points? Um, sure. Three, um, why don't you give a, a little brief description of sort of your background, um, Sidekick, uh, the recent purchase of Sidekick, and why you think that uh, advertisers and marketers really should have a diversified approach. Uh, by engaging with your ability to sort of track influencers and be able to leverage, you know, their impressions and their and their fandoms as well. Absolutely. So um, I'm Tree, one of the uh, co-founders, and I head revenue for a technology company called Sidekick. We were recently acquired by an organization here in Atlanta called Ninja Media. Um, and what our company does is we provide contacts and insights in the creator and influencer space. So we actually help brands better utilize, discover, understand this uh, relatively new uh, thing, which is influencer marketing, and then ultimately help them monetize it and have uh, drive revenue within this uh, category. Most of the brands that we work with and kind of hyper-focus in and around, they are looking to um, work with uh, influencers that are targeting the Gen Z um, or youth markets. Um, so like this space now um, is growing super fast as a lot of you guys know, and we wanna help the brands better leverage it. So that's kind of on a high level what we uh, do in the space that we play in. That's great. Um, I think the, the key was when Nick asked me to put together this group, I think for me, it was basically getting a wide variety of uh, different um, ten, uh, templates and um, groups of people that are helping marketers basically touch different audiences. And I think this is a good blend. You know, we're blessed right now as part of Warner Media and our uh, sports content. You know, tonight we have the Dodgers and the Braves on TBS, and then we have opening night with NBA on TNT. And so uh, we're at a, just a plethora of content right now where we're trying to reach designated eyeballs sports as we know has done really really well for marketers in, in exposing their brands um michael I, I i would love for you to sort of walk people through what an engagement would look like you know with you so let's say you mentioned sports betting so they have DraftKings or FanDuel uh wanted to engage with you how would they go about and we can use that example for other marketers to get them a little more familiar with what effective does yeah sure uh, i i could speak to to betting but in general uh, clients no, no matter what the category they uh, they either directly or through their agency would reach out to us um, with a proposition and that is basically um, they're trying to solve for something they want to promote a new show they want to promote um, new content a new app a, a new product um, so they sit down they work with us we we're, we're essentially consultants in uh, we try to understand what it is, what the levers are. You know, we we want to go in there and dive into who their audience is, uh, who their target audience is. Um, therefore, we can really start to um, to solve for the segments that we're chasing um, and identifying the targets that make the most sense. And then, really, it becomes a um, a, a media um, mix uh, discussion in terms of 
Is it TV? Is it IP? Is it is it video on demand? Is it is it all of the above? Um, we find that um, most of our campaigns, it, the, the more platforms that um, an ad is on, the more effective the campaign is overall, as well as the conversion report. So, I mean, I mean the uh, conversion data. So, um, so there's there's a lot to be said about being a media company that. Um, can offer a multi multi screen solution for our, our clients. Mm -hmm. So essentially, once we get the we identify the platforms that make sense, and we've already identified the audience and the target that we're looking at, um, then it becomes like what is the frequency, what is the reach, and how do how do we how do we optimize that in a way that's extremely effective? Because at the end of the day, it's about driving results. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we have an eye on, and you know it's interesting in this new world. Um, in that we're dealing with so many different types of advertisers that the KPIs are all over the place. So mm. just sticking with, uh, with entertainment for a moment, it used to be just about tune in. So tune in, tune into a show. And that, that's, that's what we were solving for. Mm. But now uh, there are so many apps, um, as everybody knows, everybody, everything from HBO Max to Peacock, Hulu, et cetera, uh, they come with their own set of uh, KPIs. Uh, they're not necessarily interested in, um, you know, tune in. They're not driven by ratings the, the way that traditional networks are. Uh, but what they are interested in solving for is they want to drive activations. They want to drive app downloads. They, um, they definitely want people to get in there and, and discover um, a lot of their content. So they're, and, and then they're also looking at, at, uh, at, retention and churn in a way that tune in networks don't necessarily um, approach their advertising campaigns. So, um, so that has changed. And then once you start going to other categories, it, it's, it's even, um, it's, it's even crazier in terms of the different, the breadth of things that we're solving for. Um, but when it comes to betting to your question specifically, um, betting is an interesting one because uh, not every state allows for uh, betting. So, you know, you're, you're dealing with a lot of targeting and you're, it's geo, but it's also really getting into um, understanding that niche, uh, niche target audience that, that actually is the perfect candidate to, to, uh, to bet. And then also you're trying to train behavior. You want people to try betting where they can. Um, so there's a lot that goes on in terms of, um, you know, really drilling down into the uh, overlaying the geographic consideration with the target scenario, uh, as well as the, um, the the segment that you're reaching for. And then the other thing too is a lot of these uh, uh, these betting companies have um, apps, and those apps um, have other things besides just pure betting. So there's a technical technical play as well. Uh, to the extent that if you can promote an app that just talks about sports and other things like that, but if you're in the right market and you and betting is allowable, um, then that function works within that particular geo. So it could get really complicated in how we go about it, but we mm -hmm. usually work with all of our clients to optimize and maximize um, the effectiveness, potential effectiveness of the campaign. Yeah, I mean, I think that's amazing about Comcast is you have so many touch points and you can reach so many different users in different markets on different platforms that it's a really nice solution. I think, Tree, we've always sort of talked about influencers and Addison Ray now signing a big deal with Netflix and TikTokers like Charlie and Dixie DiMalo basically becoming part of mainstream. And, you know, I have two young teenage daughters and, you know, in some cases they won't, you know, look or go to Target um, you know, a website to buy something. It's more what the particular influencer um, is wearing or basically, um, you know, blesses in their, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, their videos on side TikTok and those social platforms. Are you seeing from where you guys started uh, analyzing mm -hmm. the influencers? Because that's, you can talk a little bit about your platform. Are you seeing more and more, right? Where some money is sort of being blended between, you know, what Michael is doing with Comcast and what, you know, you're seeing in, in your space and that the validity yeah. of that is starting to happen. Um, Cause I know from a Warner media side, it's a blend. It's always about the blend. Yeah. Um, how do you blend and go after different markets, whether it's geolocated, just like Michael said for sports betting, but I'm, um, I'm curious if you're starting to see, you know, that mix get bigger and bigger. 
Yeah, like I would say, so like we were founded roughly eight years ago. And when we first started, everybody was viewing influencer and creator as this experimental thing that they kind of did way away from the core. Now it's becoming more of a true blend, at least within the larger organizations. But then mm-hmm. what is a really uh, interesting switch is that the smaller kind of fast growing direct to consumer brands, they are over indexing in the creator and influencer space as it relates to how they are marketing, because mm. they know basically what you just uh, described that like literally if you're targeting someone who's 15, <coughs> 20, if you do traditional media, it's not going to resonate as well. They want to ultimately kind of hyper focus and target that younger Gen Z audience and ultimately get them not just to see something, but to actually make a purchase like through that creator. And that's what we are seeing a lot of. If the brand is new, hip, young, trying to target a younger um, demo, they're over-indexing in the creator space. If they're a little bit larger, um, they're doing more of a mix, but that mix is growing. Obviously, it's most of the spin is still coming from traditional media in the larger organizations, but the influencer piece of that pie uh, went from basically nothing to now it's like uh, year over year, at least within our customers, you're looking at hundreds of percent growth. It's a pretty sizable shift versus where it was even two or three years ago. Yeah, I mean, I think we're seeing that too. Obviously, you know, we have Bleacher Report, House of Highlights. And so we're Mm -hmm. sort of blending and being able to package an overall deal with traditional media and then, you know, plugging in social and all the different platforms we are. What I am curious is, is do you feel... um, are marketers being more concerned about the user data and the first party data? And are they basically looking for sort of more hard fact evidence uh, that Mm -hmm. this is driving a particular purchase in a store? Maybe we'll start with you, Trey. Um, Do you feel like that has changed where it's not just necessarily about the exposure, Mm -hmm. but they're getting pressure from some of their, you know, uh, brands to basically drive actual purchase and 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 totally like that. Yeah. One, 100%, because it used to be all about the awareness, like, hey, let's just talk about something, talk about something. Mm. But then they they were utilizing platforms like Sidekick to actually understand, okay, this is actually driving uh, awareness. People are talking about our brand, but let's take it a step further. How do we actually drive sales? How do we drive signups for Mm. apps? How do we um, take that next step? So now when brands come, like one of the things which they're asking about, which they're talking about, they want to know how much revenue is not just the space in general driving for us. They want to drill down to the individual. How much revenue is the individual creator driving? What type of customer are they driving? Hmm. Like uh, they're, the demographics of, of that customer or that influencer's audience because they want to ultimately just niche down and narrow down more and more And ultimately, a lot of the um, younger brands, what they're trying to do is utilize that information to create new products. So it's like this this viral loop of information Mm. that they Mm. drive a sale, get information from that, create products on the fly, and they're just doing that rinse, repeat, rinse, and repeat. And the the big shift, um, I think, that got us here is that when the creator space was first getting kicked off, the brands are trying to just tell the creators what to ultimately do and now the smartest brands in the space have moved beyond that and they're just like we just want you to create content well we're going to give you some guardrails you know because there's still you have to be aware of like what makes sense for that brand and the organization but we're not going to try to stifle what you're doing because the information which we're going to glean from it is so valuable to us in the growth of our brand they're just letting that uh, influence would be super creative and just create this amazing content that is not just driving awareness, but is also driving sales, driving downloads and all this stuff, which people wanted to ultimately do bottom of the funnel. Now those creators are ultimately doing it at a pretty uh, great clip. And my, Michael, do you feel like that's the same way too? Do you feel like, um, you know, you, we both work at sort of traditional media companies where exposure was sort of our you know, our joie de vie, where we would tell everybody, hey, we have the exposure, we have the touch points, but are you seeing where markers are like, hey, that's great, Michael, but I need some data. I need some data of what you've been able to do. What are the metrics um, that are helping me prove that you're, you know, a valuable uh, solution in my portfolio of, of marketing opportunities? 
Yeah, the 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 joie de vivre is a, is a moving target. It's evolved. Right. Um, right. It, it's it's a great question. Um, yes, we're being asked all the time um, mm. to prove out um, our you know our performance um, to show results. Um, and 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 I think agencies clients are all extremely analytical right now. Mm. Um, and I think that's going to continue. Um, we actually like that though, because that's the space that we Comcast effective. We we've lived in that. It's not mm -hmm. like we're, we're just starting to think that way. And, um, we also know that, uh, when it comes to social and digital and, and traditional TV, and, uh, when you, when you look at them separately, it's, it's one story, but when you really try to optimize and you're in you, all the numbers are working for you and you're doing all the right things, you start to realize, you know what, the working them all together holistically is the best way to go. That's how you drive the best results. So you can't just think, oh, traditional TV, that's one separate island. Digital, that's a separate island. Social, it's like you got to put it all together and um, and you got to drive, um, you know, towards that KPI that you're looking for. And I find that um, more of our clients than ever before are talking about an upper and lower funnel solution where it used to be just upper um, and that's the space that we had operated in. Now um, it's more about um, you know, doing both. It's um, it's it's moving the needle on sales. It's moving the needle on viewership. It's it's all of those things. But it's also uh, spending a lot of time really reinvesting in the brand because I think a lot of companies that were advertising um, historically um, they established their brand. They they had their brand equity and they were out there um, and they felt okay. Now we can start moving into some of these other lower funnel. Um, areas we can get really specific, um, and now in this new world, digital world, where content is being consumed, you know, there's starting to be a separation of the brand from the actual show and content. And mm -hmm. you know, especially when uh, companies are playing around more with short form to try to draw in younger viewers and audiences, um, so that they can it start to enjoy the the uh, uh, the, the full length uh, experience. Um, what happens is in that social space, um, everything gets abbreviated. So with this delta that's grown between the actual attribution of the brand with the show, mm -hmm. that's a problem. So I think um, companies are, what I'm seeing is that they're doubling down on the upper funnel, the, the branding aspect of what they do, while at the same time, they're trying to get app downloads and do all of these other things. And then also too, a lot of these newer apps that are coming into play, they are new. I mean, if it's like we, I think in this industry, we, we, we kind of get used to something really quickly. Then all of a sudden it seems like it's been around for 20 years. Mm. Um, but these apps, a lot of these big apps launched in 2020, right? So, so they're coming out there and, and um, you know, and they're investing more in their, uh, their content. And some of them are putting billions of dollars into that. Mm. Um, and, you know, as they, as they start to develop that, um, they, 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 they're realizing that, you know, we have to really establish our, our brand properly with the potential viewers um, because they don't necessarily know what we stand for. So there's a lot of investment that has to go into that aspect of it. Um, so, um, you know, but then at the same day, every day, they're looking at activations every day. They're looking to see how many app loans there were. And then the, the marketplace is also looking at that as well. And the investment community is looking at that as well. So there's a lot of pressure there. So to, in any event, I, I think um, everything we look at is, is really a holistic solution. So it ties to what Tree was saying, um, but you know, we're every step of the way and every part of the, the phase of the planning, um, we're looking at a, a social play, we're looking at an IP play, we're looking at all these things hand in hand. And um, if you look at any of our campaigns now, it's interesting because you've got, um, like I said, if you're looking at upper, you're looking at lower, um, our different platforms include everything from TV to uh, video on demand to IP. And the IP part of what we do is becoming even more compelling um, because a lot of the IP that we've had in the past was usually tied to our distribution deals. But now we're going outside and getting even more short form to to add to that mix of things. So when you look at effective streaming, we have an array of different types of IP offerings, depending on what your needs are and depending on who you are as an advertiser. So, um, and then when it comes to the social play, um, live streaming is something that we've been 
uh, working with too and, and select cases with certain advertisers and the ones that are really motivated and get it. And if you're working with a tree over there and you're putting together a, um, a social campaign in the digital world, if you can take that and then you can put it into the Comcast um, platform and integrate it in there and you can drive to it um, to create some excitement, it could be pre-awareness for a premiere. It, it could be anything. Um, it could be a new product. It doesn't even have to be TV related, but um, yeah. you can start to use your, the same sensibilities you have with building social and, and digital campaigns out in the ether. And then you can, you can almost copy that and replicate that within the platform, uh, within the Comcast platform. So those are the things that, that excite me because we're getting more and more creative in how we um, come up with solutions for clients as they evolve. And like you right. said, the, the joie de vivre continues to move and so do we. Yeah, I think, I think the hardest thing is we're all battling together, marketers, media companies with time and attention. And I think the toughest thing for all of us to do is how do we grab someone's time and attention, make them stop, make them feel like, you know, there's something unique and different. You know, we were doing our HBO campaign around succession and, you know, succession is a very, very popular series with people that have HBO already, but how do you turn, you know, that particular franchise into something that will net new and new subscriber. And what are the ways to remind them that there were two seasons before sort of building up sort of that buzz of the third season that launched this weekend. So, I mean, it's it's a tough, tough business because I think all of us are trying to figure that out. I think Tree, what's really interesting is legitimacy and the humanness, right, that uh, creators have, right? Um, I've, I heard something the other day that, you know, if someone wants to uh, validate whether they should buy, you know, a particular tool or, mm -hmm. um, you know, pick a particular piece of uh, clothing or a vehicle, they usually go to YouTube in some cases just to get validated by a human, right? That there's not sort of a commercial uh, sort of spin on it. It's actually someone taking that tool and using it and saying, no, 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 this is really good. Are you starting to see, you mentioned it earlier about original content being created by these, um, by these influencers. Do you feel like that's become even more sort of interesting where it's not, you actually need something to grab and actually do something with it to provide and uh, its vitality for those particular people they're marketing to. Yeah, like we have definitely started to see um, original content from a creator standpoint, like that's mm -hmm. what they do. It's it's their livelihood. And the use case, which you just described as it relates to um, the person, people validation of like what to actually buy, I ex experience that in my own life. Um, like if I'm looking to purchase a new pair of jeans or a bag or a uh, book bag or something, that's what I do. I'm like, I'm not looking to see how does that brand talk about itself? I'm looking to see what creators are actually talking about that brand and like, how are they utilizing it in real life? Um, because like the, it's, it feels more trustworthy coming from a creator than it does coming from the brand direct. And I think that experience is what my my kids are experiencing is a trust level that you experience when it's coming directly from a third party, which is the creator, the influencer versus the brand. And I think like that's where the magic really happens is allowing someone else to talk about you in a way that is still authentic to that creator, but also represents the brand really well as well. And that's, that's where uh, influencers um, can just be transformational to your organization and frankly like they can also provide you with insights that you did not know about your your ultimate brand because right. people um at least from some of the marketers which we speak to uh when we're having those more quiet conversations when it's like okay no one outside of these walls will ultimately hear this they're like we don't necessarily know who our audience is we know who we market to we know who we talk to mm -hmm. but we don't know who our audience is and then a lot of times they might say, hey, let's utilize these two or three creators. And then our platform will help give them additional data and insight so they can hone in more tightly who their actual audience, who their customer is. Mm -hmm. And they're doing that through utilizing a creator and how did their audience resonate with their product. So it's, so it's more than just getting someone to talk about you. It can literally be used as a way to better understand your audience mm -hmm. because we've just heard it from a lot of brands where they legitimately don't know who their audience is. But obviously, if you speak about this more publicly, they're going to be absolutely, we know 100%. But right. privately, right. Uh, the 
conversations tend to be a little bit different. And, and what we really enjoy, we love giving brands the opportunity to experiment with new platforms mm -hmm. because since we are so data focused, context focused, um, a couple of years ago when TikTok was starting to, I guess, get more um, awareness from brands, we were early in on just gathering the data, aggregating it, um, giving brands insight. But that gave for our customers that are experimenting on that platform a couple of years ago, permission to actually experiment because they were able to tie it to data and insights and then correlate that with like other platforms as well. So it was an interesting um, pathway uh, that we were, that we've actually helped our brands kind of undergo over the last few years. Um, I think what's interesting is, is you're right. And I think Michael, I, I think you probably have some flexibility where you can create the content, kind of sniff out the reaction of the content, then in some cases on Comcast, readjust it. Do you feel like people are starting to leverage content in that way, right? So you sort of sniff it out, you see what, you know, sort of registers initially, and then you could potentially re reportion, you know, your spend to where you see the reactions come. Are you seeing that more as opposed to sort of everybody putting everything in two or three baskets? Um, so sort of tasting first, then seeing what happens, and then basically reacting to what that initial, um, you know, sort of release of content looks like. Uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it's a good question in that uh, and we do know when looking at hundreds and hundreds of campaigns that the ones that had a, a pretty decent mix of creative were the ones that did, did the best, um, you know, in terms of conversion. So if you just have one voice and one message, um, you, you tend to not get the the the, uh, the results you're looking for. So, you know, on average, you, six different creatives is what it takes to really get to that next level of uh, conversion. I do. I did want to uh, pick up on something that Tree said that was interesting in that clients don't really know who their target audience is. That is so true. I, I, you know, it's there. There are a lot of uh, um, mark uh, companies and, and brands out there that they think they know, and and they do to an extent. You know, a, a lot of them actually have um, um, direct to consumer. They products so that they've been honing and really mining uh, their audiences and everything like that uh, for some time. And then they invest in a lot of this. They, I mean, on one hand, they, yes, they do know, but, but the part that gets lost a lot of times is everybody, um, while they're focused on, you know, that sweet spot, sometimes they're neglecting the mining of new, new audiences, um, you know, and, and that's a big pool, you know, that's, a, that's, that's a lot to work with. And, um, so really, there's a lot more um, effort that's going into the analytical part and the modeling part of how we try to really identify the, the audiences, um, because a client might come in thinking one thing, but we can expand it, their thinking to think about other things. I mean, we already, we already do that with the mix of, of networks and other things that we add to a campaign, but relative to really honing in on the audience that they want, um, it's, it's really a, a test and learn it's, it's okay. You know, and it's a growth, um, aspect because you constantly have to bring in new and new audience. It's like, for example, if you have a, a network that comes in and they want to advertise and they just want to look at everybody who watched that same show from a year ago, um, you know, well, those, those, uh, viewers have gone into other things. They're not all right. going to be there. You're not going to get right. that same number. So you got to yeah. go and you got to, you got to try to bring in some more and draw on, on some more on some more um, uh, potential. So um, anyway, I just thought tree that was that was awesome. No, I, I'm hearing yeah. that and well, seeing that. Um, there's every a day. there's a really good question in the in the in the chat from Sarah, and she's asking sort of that proverbial question: is how do you sort of balance an agency's approach where you want to go spend money on Michael's platform, my platform, which is more traditional, but at the same time you want to sort of do a blend. So you know, if all three of us were together, it'd be great. We create our own sort of agency where it was a blend of sort of what we all do really, really well. So on one side of the fence, you're sort of balancing the traditional sort of brand agencies it's like, no, we want TV, we want sports, we want these big temple events. But at the same time, uh, you know, we want to try out these little places. How do you tell a marketer 
you know, Tree, we can start with you in the sense of how do you balance that strategy? How do you tell a marketer that, yes, you should be using Michael. Yes, you should be using Pete, mm -hmm. um, but it should be in a balanced, blended approach so that there's sort of a win-win from all of it. Because I think obviously different marketers have different needs. Um, you know, we've been very successful with sports. You'll see tonight, um, mm -hmm. especially with TNT and baseball, the exposure is great. But at the same time, we want to blend that um, you know, as much as we can on social and get sort of that natural, authentic voice out there as well. Um, how do you sort of tell somebody who's out there marketing um, that they go to a particular agency and they say, okay, you really need to do both. And the, they both support each other in one way or another. Yeah, like you, so um, as a organization, we um, obviously, we believe very strongly in the creator influencer space, but we also believe strongly that you need a good blend and a mix of all of these tactics. Um, but I would first understand like who you ultimately trying to reach and target, and that will have a better um, line of sight in terms of where you would spend more of your capital at. So if you're trying to focus on a more of a youth oriented marketplace, you probably need to have a larger spend across the creator influencer social sphere than you would traditional media. Mm. But on the flip side, if you're targeting people 30s and 40s, that split doesn't necessarily have to be as heavily weighted and you don't have to utilize some of the um, newer, younger platforms like TikTok, Snap, and I guess they're not like new, new platforms, but they steer towards a younger a demographic. You can maybe find like a blend from Instagram or even Facebook if your audience is a little bit uh, older. But as a whole, we do like to promote a blend. Um, but given most of our clients tend to be focused in around that youth oriented market, basically 35 and under, um, we do like to have most of them like to over index in the creator influencer social space. And if you are direct to consumer, then that, as I stated earlier, that um, mm -hmm. level of spin tends to be very heavily weighted. And if you are a new emerging brand, it's even more heavily weighted. But the interesting area that like for, for us, where I like to see kind of what's coming next, I look at gaming and esports because typically until recently, the last couple of years, they had smaller budgets. How are they marketing to their target audience, their markets, and they were early in on utilizing YouTube and like uh, TikTok and all these other platforms in a content creator format and then integrating in some of the brand conversation into that. And now you're seeing that happen more broadly outside of gaming, but they did it out of necessity. So what they're doing now, like they're bringing other people into the uh, tent, which I think other brands should start to think about too. Like now, if you're a big gaming brand, you're not just focused on people who actually play games all the time. You're literally focused on that, that mom or that like young kid who may play casually, but we're going to do a partnership with like Post Malone or somebody to bring in a broader spectrum of people. They're constantly thinking about expansion of their brand, not just digging deeper with their existing core audience because out of necessity, they know that core audience is only so big, they have to get bigger. So um, I think that is a big difference between what's happening there and what I think brands in general are going to start to move towards of expanding that tent and how do we get more people to really dig in and love the brand, the organization which we're focused on. But brand mix, again, I, or uh, mix, I like to uh, see a higher spend across social and create an influencer. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's some great questions popping in now. So I just want to get to these guys Um you know, Michael, there's uh, the, this pandemic and what it's caused is sort of uh, everybody to be a little more digital savvy, right? So when people start to move out of their homes and start to basically hit the streets and ride buses and see billboards, have you started to see a change in that, that because now maybe people are more technology savvy, you have to change the plans that maybe once before pre-pandemic were sort of traditional, but now sort of this new uh, technology, this new uh, digital sort of awareness that they're, you're sort of getting these requests like, oh, well, that's interesting because before that, that wasn't a request. Are, are you starting to see that? And then yeah, quite frankly, yeah, maybe give an example where Comcast is like, yeah, we got it. We got you covered there. This is where we do it. And this is how we can help you. 
but are you seeing sort of that demand starting to happen sort of in this post uh, pandemic uh, time? Yeah, I, I, th I think, uh, I mean, the answer is yes. And um, over this period of time, the interesting thing is that as people were home and, and we all saw the results of people being at home and how that impacted TV and viewership and all of those, those things. Mm -hmm. um, but what was also happening um, running parallel to all that was innovation. I think companies started to figure out, um, you know, they kind of really knew what the blueprint was. Like they, you got to have addressable, you got to move to impressions, you got to do, you know, all of these things. There's a whole litany of, of ideas, um, but the timetables got accelerated. So, um, so in the last two years, um, you'll, you'll see that at least I know for Comcast, for sure, um, we accelerated a lot of our, our product rollouts and, um, and that included not only the, um, the ability to, to better target with, uh, you know, and, and then the impression based architecture and a lot of our, our, our offerings, but on the, um, on the, anal, anal, the, the result side in terms of proving it out and, and the measurement side. Um, that's where we really scaled a lot of our offerings and provided a lot more um, transparency into, um, into the results. And, you know, because it's one thing to give client results. Um, and say, hey, here's, here's, how, here's what the numbers look like, but it's, it's the interpretation that comes along with it that is most impactful because that allows a, a brand to re-pivot and to rethink and reconsider how um, they should target and, and how they can optimize the results. So, um, I guess a good example is, you know, the theatrical space, um, you know, there historically were three different budgets, home entertainment, uh, digital, and then and the theaters themselves. So the studios were playing that game and they, they had their, these, these different silos. Um, but with the pandemic, um, what it did is it almost collapsed the walls. And now the thought process is, okay, well, who's going to a movie theater when theaters come back into play and who's seeing it and who's not? Okay, we wanna know who they are. And then who's going to that next stage of ordering PVOD or, or a transactional or taking advantage of a transactional play? And then who's not? And what the studio is looking for is to understand um, who that, that behavior, like who was it that was, was either ordering it or not ordering it. And, and as you go through that whole full cycle, uh, life cycle, um, along the way, you're adjusting your marketing and you're adjusting your targets. And that's ultimately how you really improve conversion and, and really maximize your marketing efforts. So um, we've, we've also worked on our end to be able to, to solve for that with our clients. And that was just the studio side of it, but everyone's going through the same consideration. Mm -hmm. And, um, but again, I think it's, it's this level of, it's the speed of innovation happens so quickly and, um, you know, um, some companies, I think, heard those, those uh, signals, uh, uh, you know, a while back, two years ago, even more. And, um, and then now, they, you know, we're positioned really to take advantage of, of exactly what you just said. People are going back to work and they're more mobile and, they're, and, that, and they're, you know, they still need to consume. And as a marketer, you still want to reach them. And so I think we're, we've, uh, with all the different offerings that we have from, um, you know, from addressable, like I had mentioned before, and, um, you know, uh, and being able to really go in there and help hone those targets, um, you know, it's, it's all coming together right now for us, especially with the whole specter of uh, TV everywhere and, mm. and just really recognizing and capturing, capturing that attention um, when you're not just in, in front of your TV. What, what a, an interesting question came up today also in the chat and the Q&A, and please, these questions are awesome. Um, you know, do we ever fail with moving targets, right? Can you give an example, uh, you know, maybe Tree, where you had a great failure, you had a great success, you know, how do you sort of articulate to the marketer, you know, okay, well, we saw this, it maybe didn't work as well, we're going to change plans, or we did so well that this is sort of reaffirming our estimates of where you should be putting your money um, you know, giving some examples as marketers, because these guys who are watching today are responsible for large budgets and they're going to fail and they're going to succeed. What do you tell them in those instances where you may confront that? What is the nuance of sort of maybe getting back up and trying something different? Um, what, what would you give them as advice, both for the successes and the, and the failures of a campaign? 
Yeah, so um, when we work with brands and we are a, 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 tech, a technology platform first and foremost, and when we work with the uh, brands and organizations, something that we try to um, reiterate and make, and make sure that everybody's on the same page with is just constant experimentation. The mm-hmm. great thing about our space is that you can run effectively multiple experiments at any one time, iterate against it and get better and better. Um, you don't go all in at, at one time, you take a step, you take another step, then you're jogging, then you're running. So like, we just like to try to bring up, how can we make smaller experiments that, that turn into larger experiments that turn into large wins? But knowing within that path, you're going to fail sometimes, you know, like that's just a part of it, but failure is one step closer to winning. Um, so like, that's what we try to give people permission, you know, um, and then to also, when we're talking to them, it's all about referencing data, information, context, um, and, and uh, we just try to guide them just like we would anything else is just experimentation. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's all about partnership, right? Like you wanna work with them as successful as you can. Another good question, Michael, you know, with so many different, um, the challenge of delivering content across so many platforms, right? And making sure you get the ad creative right on one platform and on the other. Um, how, do, how do brands, agencies better understand the nuances or the best practices of particular uh, platforms they choose. Like, you know, it might be frequent capacity capping on digital or it could be social or linear. Um, where do you sort of coach them? I, I think that's the key where all of us are trying to be partners with these brands. We're sort of trying to give them the best solutions. There's so much to choose from. Um, you know, what are those, you know, examples where you've sort of done the same thing uh, with? Yeah, um, it, it's, uh... We're partners, um, and in in many ways, I feel like we're consultants now. Um, oh, interesting. Just, yep. You know, we have a chance to, you know, we have the purview of seeing what works, right? And you know, we can, see, you know, we know that we can if we can apply that best practice over here, it could help this particular client. So you know, we don't share um, specific names of brands and things like that for competitive reasons, but you know, generally over time, we we can figure out. Um, the best practice of, of a particular for a particular category, and um, and then we'll put that out there. We'll we'll actually put papers out there. Um, we we try to be thought leaders in that space. Um, so we'll you know we have like even with media and entertainment, we we can we can rattle off about four or five best practices like longer campaigns work, and you know mm. you know mixing up the creative that you use, and um, there's like there's there's multiple platforms all of these things can help improve your results um so uh, so we're not shy about that we we uh if we look if we embark on a campaign with a client and the results are not as not as great you know it could be a lot of factors that are driving that it could be you know there wasn't enough spend that maybe the um maybe some platforms were performing better than others uh, maybe it was the creative, but you know, uh, it really it, it it's 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 a two adults just sitting down, us the agency, the client. You know, it's it's um and just trying to understand that better. So, you know, we, we're creating a process as we go along. Um, I think the agencies are awesome because they get it. They 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 also want to perf- perform. They, they want right. their to be there as well. So they're they're vested in this with us and constantly trying to ask each other the tough questions, the right questions. But it, it goes to what I was saying earlier that everything is becoming super hyper analytic and for good reason. And it's really for that. It's trying to understand where we're hitting the mark, and where we're not. Test and learn, all of those things. That's, that's really the new philosophy um, that we have. And I'm seeing it in other places too. It's not just a Comcast thing. It's just, that's just the, the state of the world. You have to constantly, constantly try, keep pushing it and, and learn and learn and learn. And we also find that a lot of clients are coming to us directly, especially in media and entertainment and saying, hey, if you're trying any new products or new platforms, we want to be a part of it. We don't care. And we just, you know, we'll share with you our results. You, you can, you know, you share your results. And, and, and if we have a problem with privacy, okay, we'll do it in such a way that, um, you know, we can compare notes. Um, but still kind of figure yeah, out the attributes and the signals, right. See the inferences yeah. that you're saying. Um, we're getting close to the end. So 
what I wanted you to think about is, you know, what campaign have you seen recently that you thought was uh, exemplary, right? That did something that's super, super unique. I don't, I, don't I, I saw one really interesting the other day where no one could have predicted the squid room, right? And the success of, you know, that popularity and that organic. And I think all of us as marketers would just sort of dream to have that sort of ability. In fact, uh, you know, even my Instagram started getting Halloween costumes from the actual series itself, which is, you know, to me, sort of your closing of the brand and basically allowing Netflix to sort of go to a different area. Between the both of you, if you were to, and sorry to kind of put you on the spot, but if you were to see a campaign that you saw recently that sort of did the caveat, right, uh, across all the different platforms and where you were snacking upon in your own sort of lifestyle, what did you see that was su super unique or super different um, that, you know, you're like, yeah, they're onto something or they're doing what we talked about really consistently throughout this whole chat tonight is basically you got to blend it. Um, and you saw something where that blend was super, super effective. Maybe Mike, we'll start with you and then we'll finish up with Trey. Uh, I, I don't want to be biased. I, 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 I have to say um, the Olympics and what you know, okay. NBC did uh, there because it was um, it had everything. It was fully loaded. I mean, it was right. just every platform you can imagine, all the social applications you could think of, a lot of the original content that went along with it. Um, you know, you know, and also getting uh, not only the athletes but also other other like cool social representatives to kind of get the message across. And um, and then even within our platform itself, uh, the use of short form and um you know how catch up was used and it's it just for me i was just wowed i mean i think um it it and also too that's a part of what drives a lot of innovation is um you know when you're in a big organization like ours um it's not like we're we're isolated we're you know we're all working off of each other right and when you have big properties like the olympics that takes you into different uh, areas uh, and it accelerates your your product rollouts so anyway, I think that for me okay. um, is a perfect example, but that not everybody has all of those resources at any right. given time, but I think that is the ultimate example. Yeah, but I think you're hundred percent. I mean, I think I did, you know, you followed all the different stories, the extension of those brands and all those different platforms. And then, you know, I think you're hundred percent right. Um, you know, I saw that recently with James Bond movie where he's doing everything from uh, Jimmy Kimmel to Fallon on the Tonight Show to you know, uh, shots into my Instagram account, or, you know, if I like a particular car and the Jaguar, like, I get it now. Um, you know, I, I'm really sort of, yeah. it's almost like if it doesn't have it today, uh, and you're not thinking about that and making it sort of cross platform and creating different creative for different platforms, you're sort of putting yourself at risk, or at least put it out there, test it, see what they got, grab on first and kind of go from there. Tree, is there anything that you've seen um, that your particular sort of in your space that um, you found um, to be interesting and, and unique. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll finish up after this. Yeah, probably uh, the most recent one. Uh, so organization called FaZe Clan, they're in gaming and esports. And, and uh, they recently signed a uh, music artist, which is like a new foray for them. But how they were creating content around the signing, it was mm -hmm. YouTube, it was TikTok. They, they integrated in a lot of other creators um, in a just kind of like pop-in manner. It was really engaging, really, and frankly, got tons of eyeballs, tons of views. Um, so I really enjoyed that. And I can say that even though uh, something I'm involved in is a competitor of them, but like you, you have to give credit where credit is due. Like they did an amazing job of launching that artist and engaging a bunch of different types of people across multiple platforms. And uh, I think how they create content is really engaging, um, specifically all across social. Yeah, I, yeah, and I, and I think I'll wrap up today with just saying, hey, thanks everybody for joining us. I think you're getting the general message that you gotta blend you know, what you're doing on the marketing front. Uh, you wanna uh, basically test, learn, and then reiterate and test again. And I think sometimes all of us don't have that luxury uh, because of different tune in or different opportunities. But I think what you're getting that general feeling is, is you know, both Tree and Michael and really most agencies or partners you work with should be partners, right? They should be working for you to analyze the data and present 
you know, really good um, value for your particular brand. Um, so thanks guys. I mean, I could go for another hour easy. Uh, you know, I got all kinds of stuff and we could follow up, you know, maybe there's a post, something that we can do. Um, but I really enjoyed it. I think we're all in a, a very, very interesting time of experimentation and we're looking for, you know, um, opportunities to get really smart people in the room to help figure out how we drive it, uh, attention and time spent with a particular brand. And I think we're all trying to figure that out. And it's good to have people like you in the space, whether it's a large traditional company like ourselves or like Comcast that has multiple touch points, or it's really just focusing on, you know, the creator content world and uh, creator networks and, and where that's going. So um, I want to just thank everybody for, for joining us. The questions were fantastic and uh, looking forward to, uh, you know, just learning more from everybody. Um, and reach out. I'm sure uh, we'll provide some emails if you guys want to contact us or are interested in our particular platforms. You know, if you want to do something with Comcast or with Tree, uh, we'll get that information out to you. But uh, more importantly, enjoy the rest of your week. Um, go Braves. Uh, we're hoping the Braves will continue on their magical run. Um, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks so much. Yep. Take care. Thanks again, y'all. We're going to put this video on the AMA Atlanta website so that you can share it in the, uh, to other members that weren't able to join today. A big thank you again to Peter, to Tree, to Michael for the time. Lots of great people here uh, from the media side, from the agency side, brand side, a lot of great education around this. The, the, the fact that we've heard so many positive things around experimentation, consultative approach, which is something that we're all looking for, even in alliances with the brands that we work with, all great things. We appreciate your time and effort. Thanks for everyone for joining. And we look forward to seeing you all again soon at a future event. Thanks again. Bye, everybody.